Welcome in to another episode of an Abundance of Thrones. Garrett here, Brad and Wade. We are recapping uh, episode 8, The Mountain and the Viper. Holy shit, what an episode. Whoa, <laughs> pulling out the profanity without the explicit spoiler. Whoa. Whoa. Surprise, surprise, just like the show. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> Holy shit. So, uh... In case you haven't caught on, this will be an explicit <laughs> podcast. That's right. You didn't and get it also, by now in the last, oh, I don't know, seven episodes. Um, yes. Get with the damn program, fellas. And, and then also this, there will be spoilers in this. We are discussing episode eight, The Mountain and the Viper. So if you have not seen it yet, stop listening unless you just enjoy having your episode spoiled. Maybe you don't have HBO right now and you're trying to get a gist of what happened and want our commentary, in which case we condone your actions. Absolutely. We're not saying don't listen to us if you haven't watched the show yet. We're just saying that if you just haven't watched warned. the show... You might want to before doing Yeah, hearing us. that's all we're saying. That's all we got to say. But make sure it. you come back. That's right. Uh, so the business end of the, po- or the podcast and the episode, uh, director Alex Graves, who we have seen... From season three, episode four, and now his watch has ended. Season three, episode five, Kissed by Fire. Season four, episode two, The Lion and the Rose. And season four, episode three, Breaker of Chains. Uh, And not to mention, he's amassing quite a collection. He is. And he will also be doing the season four finale, uh, of which I don't have the title in front of me yet, because we're not there yet. It's fine. Uh, I believe it's, it might be Watchers on the Wall. I know that's one of the two. It's called The Children. The children. That's right. How cryptic is that? Uh, writers, David Benioff, D.B. Weiss for this episode. Viewership, we have matched last, uh, I don't want to say last week, last episode at 7.2 million for so far a tie of higher viewership. That's, you know, quite a decent number of people. For... Uh, only a total of 27 episodes aired so far? Yeah, that is substantial. And that, you know, most shows that by the third season, they're into 40 to almost 50 episodes. We're only well, let's be thankful this is on HBO, because if it had been Fox, you know, it would have been canceled by now. <laughs> wow, we have lots of people watching. Let's cancel it. Let's cancel it. Let's piss them all off. Uh, let's see if I can stumble through the show summary. Because that's probably what's going to happen here. It's a big one. It's extensive. Abbreviate. Abbreviate. Um, Stuff happened. Done. Stuff happened. (laughs) So the wildlings arrive at Molestown, which if we don't remember, uh, Gilly and young Sam are there. Egret spares Gilly and young Sam. Sam at the wall believes that Gilly is dead and blames himself for putting her in that situation. Ramsey forces Reek, former Theon Greyjoy, to masquerade as his former self and orders the Ironborn, who are currently holding Mount Kaelin, to surrender it and be safely escorted to uh, the Stony Shore for uh, a trip back home. To which that would be they were. Moat Kaelin. Moat Kaelin. What'd I say? Mount Kaelin. Oh, no, definitely Moat Kaelin, which, if you weren't paying attention, was in the opening. Uh, credits. It was the yes. uh, debut of its location on the opening map credits. To which, let's see, Ramsey lies, of course, because he's a murderous psychopath, and kills all the Ironborn who were occupying Moat Kalen, not sending them back to the Iron Islands as promised. Bruce Bolton claims Ramsey as his true son and heir to. Uh, his lineage after he secured the moat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, across the narrow sea, Missandei and Grey Worm deal with sexual tension between the two of them. Uh, Grey Worm gets to see Missandei as we do naked at the stream. She is a healthy woman. He then confronts her after the fact to apologize if she was uncomfortable. They both express that they were happy to have found themselves in that situation. Uh, uh, Barristan Selmy gets a letter from across the narrow sea expressing Jorah's spying on Daenerys. 
Daenerys confronts Jorah on this and exiles him from Marine. Uh, outside the gate of the Vale, the Hound and Arya arrive and are informed of Lysa's death, in which case Arya laughs like a whack job. Uh, Littlefinger is on trial to see if he is innocent for the death of Lysa. Saved by Sansa and her testimony of Lysa's apparent suicide, Oberyn, let's see. Okay, and then we meet up to King's Landing, where <laughs> we find uh, Jamie and Tyrion have a very interesting discussion about their simpleton cousin who likes to beat on beetles. To which case we get to the fight scene of which the title, the episode gets its title. Oberyn, who we think has the upper hand, gets a little too overconfident and careless and finds himself with a crushed skull. In which case Tyrion's fate is sealed for and... He's guilty. Found guilty in the eyes of the gods. There's also a episode recap on Huffington Post. There is a link to that in the show notes. So if you're interested for more, uh, check that out. Also, what I've done, which is a lot of fun, is that on the Game of Thrones YouTube page, the writers do kind of a behind the scenes and kind of try to express what they were trying to tell us in the show, but being a little more blunt about it. So that's always kind of fun if you're looking for other in insights. Well, that was seven minutes. Yeah, I was. I'm telling you, this friggin' that was that was a paraphrased uh, summary. So be glad. One of the writers got a bit too uh, happy with the keyboard that particular. There's summary. a lot that happened this episode, and and a fair amount that I forgot about until I watched it the second time around. So who wants to take the reins? Bueller. Uh, Castamere. Bueller. Reigns of Castamere, yes. <laughs> Wrong Reigns, though. The song Reigns of Castamere is Reigns as in the weather, not Reigns as in uh, ruling. What that do? Yes. Or Reigns as in horses. Yes. Why are there so many words for this? so many different It's a things? homophone joke. Never mind. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> you move on. Take it. Run it. Start talking. Run it. Okay, fine. I will run it. Um, so the brothers in black are kind of scared. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's there's some stuff coming. Um, I was, I suppose amused is not the word, but uh, intrigued by Ed's comment that, look, you know, we're pretty much going to lose. So whoever's the last man standing, burn everyone else because yep. we're not coming back. Be a good lad. I've had enough of this world. I'd rather not come back to it. Yeah. Yeah, we see John oh. being, um, you know, he's upholding the statement of we need to stay at the wall. We need to mm -hmm. fight and protect at the wall. If we leave, we will be picked apart one by one in the way the wildlings want us to. We need to take advantage of the stronghold and stay put. Yep. Even They're making a stand at Ca Castle Black. Exactly. Even, Even though it's not what Sam wants to hear right now. Even being horribly, horribly, horribly outnumbered. Hundred, it's 100,000 to 100, so... Is it each man has to kill 100? It's 1,000 to 1. 10,000 wildlings? Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good odds. <laughs> I'd bet against that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um... I thought Egret was surprisingly brutal, this scene. I mean, she was killing some More people that didn't usual? necessarily need killing. Oh, I see More than usual? Huh? More than usual? Well, yeah, I mean, we've seen her be a little more passive when she's around John, and even though she's done some things that were like, whoa. But, I mean, she just straight speared a couple of women that didn't really pose that big of a threat to her. Well, this is, let's be honest, this is... She sees it as the more I do this, the more I call John out, you know, this is how I'm going to get to him. And this is, and she's being dead right fast in this. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was kind of seeing it the same way that Wade just said, you know, yeah, she did 
make a turn for the more passive and gentle side until John pissed her off. You know, what loyalty does she have to anyone south of the wall now? That's true. I did like the scene where it showed Gilly, and once uh, Egret left, it showed the blood dripping down between the boards of the Jeez. of the then ceiling, but obviously they were uh, level below. That right. was a nice little touch, though, a little bit of detail that uh, didn't necessarily have to be there, but it did make an impression that it was there. Yep. Um, that whole scene is uh, new for the TV series. Not in the books. Not in the books. Yeah. I didn't recall anything like that either, but like I said, it's been so long since I've actually been educated in the writings of George that even <laughs> stuff that's in the books, I'm like, was that really yeah. there? So Yeah. No. Uh, in the gospel, according to George, Egret had never met Gilly. Uh, and in this, she didn't really know that she did either. She just saw someone with a kid and decided to take the higher road, I guess. True. Good uh, point. So, let's see. Moving on from that, we want to jump up to the veil and, and discuss this whole... The trial. The trial trial for Littlefinger. So Much he, shorter than Tyrion's. Well, <laughs> he had someone on his <laughs> side. I was, I was, yeah, he had someone on his side, and he was able to talk his way out of this one rather than having to resort to combat. Well, he wasn't able to talk his way out of it. Now, according to the writers, George and Dan, they pretty much were saying that Littlefinger had written Sansa off as just this little girl who uh, couldn't learn or wouldn't learn and was kind of hopeless, but he still had a an affection for her because of the lineage and, and whatnot. But we see in this episode that not only does she not learn, she has learned a lot. She's learned how to lie. She's learned that even though she may not trust Littlefinger, she knows him and doesn't know these other people. So she's going to err on the side of that. She's learned how to play Game of Thrones. She did. She learned that now Littlefinger has a weakness, and that weakness is her. And she can kind of play that now and, and manipulate him a little bit with that. Uh, she's grown a lot this season. Agreed. She's not the scared, cowering little girl that we see taken from Winterfell. No, but she played a damn good part of being uh, emotional in the oh, trial yeah. scene. Oh, definitely. I mean, you thought she was that scared little girl because she played that scared little girl part so well in this uh, this this trial. Until, you know, laying her head on the shoulder of Lady Anya, you see her just look up at Littlefinger like, yeah, I just uh -huh. saved your ass. Yep. And then we cut to the where she's sewing in her room. He comes in, asks, why did, why did she save him? And she expressed, well, I know what you want. He's like, well, do you? And she looks up like, bitch, please. <laughs> <laughs> Don't I know try who me. you are, and, I know and, what you do. And I very know. subtly you see the look of on his face of, damn it, I'm <laughs> caught. So, uh, definitely seeing a lot of growth in Sansa's character. I did find it interesting that in the show they decided for her to release her identity to these three people that she admits, I don't know them, I don't know what they would have done to me, yet... Yeah. I had to maybe play this card so the lie would be more convincing. I'm not really sure there. Which, again, is not part of the books. Correct. Uh, Which, that is uh, just, you know, for our listeners and for you guys, that's not a complaint. It's an observation. Oh, no, of course. We, uh, we definitely respect Dan and David's creative abilities and adapt adaptations. And knowing that a lot of times George is right over their shoulder whispering in their ear too. So they're not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize the core story yep. unlike other HBO series. This is very much going to be George's story told on, on screen. So, And he said several times that, you know, now that he's five books in, 
there were things there there are things he wishes he could go back and change. So this and this could, is kind yeah. of his opportunity to. Yeah, so this exactly. could be that exact change that he could be looking for. Uh correct. Agreed on both parts. Do we need to get into Moat Kalen and the Ironborn there? I um th- I think the summary... The only thing the only thing I would comment on that is um Oh jeez. Still shows how much Reek is broken. Yep. Even he's sitting there, it's like, oh, you're Theon. He's like, no, Reek. No, yeah, no, even, Reek. yeah, when the one guy axes the other one in the head, he's sitting there kind of mumbling to himself, Reek, trying to re emphasize who he thinks he is. Even yep. though he's telling people, I'm, I'm Theon Greyjoy, I'm wearing the armor of, of the Iron Islands, and, but he has the ability. To be Theon again, and we see how broken he is once more. Yeah, he can't hold it together. Yeah. Um, the thing, it was only shown on camera very briefly, but uh, Ramsey makes the comment that, um, you know, that it's not a tradition that's been done, is done much recently, but we get to see that all the guys that they have captured have been flayed. Yeah, you saw the bigger guy that axed the primary guy Theon Reek was talking to who said if we surrender we get to go free and then you see him staked up and his whole chest is flayed off and you yep. and uh, Ramsey does say well you didn't think I'd actually let them leave did you mm-hmm. so you definitely get the impression that not only were they all killed but they were killed in the fashion of the Boltons which, seems to enjoy that he does. And in the writer's words, and Dan uh, Dan Weiss's words, he is a murderous sociopath. Yes. Although you do start to feel a little bit of something, a little bit of accomplishment, a little bit of uh, uh, some emotional tie when Roos does claim him as his true-born son. You're like, oh, well, how cool it must be for him to get that uh, accommodation and that honor. And then you realize, oh, wait, this guy's a whack job. <laughs> He gets things done, but in a very bad way. And that's kind of Bruce's yeah. stance, is that he doesn't really care how it gets done as long yeah. as it gets done. So, we also, let's see here. So, let's jump over to Jorah, and I'm glad this finally came in, because this seemed like a key factor in the book, and had been glossed over a lot of the times in the show, but Jorah finally yeah. gets... Uh, called out as being a spy against Danny for the realm and for his own uh, pardon back into Westeros. And I'm just glad we get to see this tension and whatnot. I'm not sure how far they'll go with it because we did get the transition from the book version of the House of the Undying to the show version, which doesn't call any attention to these betrayals that she is supposed to face. And a couple differences here to point out. Um, Sir Barristan already knew in the books. He was on the small council when Varys brought uh, Jorah's, the news of Danny's pregnancy f- from Jorah um, via, or sorry, when, uh, start again, geez. <laughs> Var- Varys brings the news to King Robert that Jorah is reporting of Danny's pregnancy. So we're going back quite a ways. He's known. Okay. He was on yeah, this small council in the This is back season books. one because... Yeah. Obviously, uh, that's when Robert was on the throne. Yep. Um, so in the books, he's known for a while, and in the show, this comes as a kind of a surprise. And the other difference departure is in the show, uh, Danny is very calm... Uh, angry, but, you know, pulled together and composed when she hands down the sentence. Whereas in the book, um, she'd become quite attached to Sir Jorah and is completely beside herself. Yeah, I was disappointed in that in the show. Um, I was expecting a much more emotional expression yeah. from from Danny, And also when, in the inside look of the episode from David and Dan... 
they were trying to make comparisons with this scene versus when Viserys, Danny's brother, pointed a sword at her stomach when she was carrying Drogo's child and trying to make the link between when Viserys was threatening the life of her child and now Jorah also, we find out, has put that, ch that potential child into what could have been danger. Uh, there's a similarity between those, those two from season uh -huh. one now to season four. And so her reaction is kind of alluded to be reminiscent. Uh, but yet in the show for season four, she is definitely more reserved and more collected, as you Agreed. specified. Yep. Uh, let's see here. I want to touch base on the Beatles story between Tyrion and Jamie, only because it seemed like a pointless scene and a lot of time wasted that could have been elsewhere, as you said with previous shows. Uh, there could have been some more gratuitous nudity or violence or HBO quality content. But <laughs> what the... Earn, earn their stripes here. That's right. What the writers were trying to express, though, is that this is a time where Tyrion is kind of lost. None of these actions are making any sense to him. Why he's being framed or why people are so against him without any legitimate proof and... It takes him back to his childhood and his simpleton cousin where he couldn't figure out why his cousin was so dedicated to smashing these beetles. Even though he was a simpleton, um, this is the thing that brought him joy. And, and Tyrion and all his wit just couldn't figure this out. And so it's supposed to be a mirror of what's going on now with Tyrion. All these actions and this trial taking place and it's just, it just doesn't make any logical sense to him. So there's, they're trying to make a parallel there, and that's where the mind goes when you're faced with uh, situations of such uncertainty, I suppose. I hope they go elsewhere with it as well, though. Yeah, I hope it leads to something, too. I mean, I hope there's, you know, maybe the cousin pops up for some reason. Or I thought they said that the cousin died. You're right. He got kicked in the chest by a mule, and he's dead. <laughs> so he's not popping up. Unless they pulled like an Obi Wan Kenobi kind of thing going on here. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I'm hoping that I, I, in future episodes it gets revisited and there's a point to this story. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I'm not sure there will be or not because of what they were saying of the the sure. their original purpose for this story their was to been made. yeah was to uh, uh, make a correlation. So sure. I, I doubt it'll come back up, but I just wanted to. Maybe give some clarification to people because I felt the same way. That's kind of out of all the things to talk about, you talk about a simpleton cousin smashing beetles for what seemed like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. There's so. a lot of beetles in that garden, by the way. <laughs> he should sit out there for what three hours a day at least just smashing beetles. How many freaking beetles are in that garden? Yeah, where's he getting his beetles from? It's this is Tywin Beetle Lannister, juice. just be like, yep, just order more Beatles. <sighs> well, it's not it's just... Tywin's kid, so, you know, it's kind of whatever. It's a cousin, so. Yeah. Um, and with all that stuff out of the way, unless there's some other scenes you guys want to touch base on, we can jump into the... The meat. The meat of this episode. Literally. Literally. Yep. Uh, who, wants to, who wants to take it? Where have you been quiet? I've been quiet. I don't know what to say. I mean... That was well, gruesome. Well, yeah, that was... The event was almost foretold. I mean, I'm some people are saying they're getting tired of the... What, the foretelling or the predictability. Some of it is starting to get predictable. I mean, now we're seeing the Purple Wedding and what Joffrey was doing there and then what Oberyn was doing over the mountain. It was like... You're kind of asking for it. Well, and you get that line from Tyrion about, well, you're not wearing armor. Well, you should at least wear a helmet. And yeah. so there's a lot of internet posts now online about, hey, kids, lesson for today, wear a helmet. Or, you know, just little call outs with that. 
Um, on a funny side note, Pedro, who plays uh, Prince Oberyn, after the episode, tweeted out about this raging headache that he, he can't get rid of for some reason. <laughs> so it's pretty cool that the actor... Um, apparently, he's a really he was a really big fan. And before he even flew to Europe to be on set, he spent a good few weeks practicing wushu, which is the martial art form that he was imitating for the show. So that's kind of cool. But wasn't too bad at it. No, nope, uh, definitely a cool, different art form from what we've been seeing in the show of the very medieval sword and armor fight, with the exception of the Dothraki. I have to point out, though, it, it does show some of the futility and certainly short-sightedness that comes in from, um, you know, revenge killing. And not that he didn't have reason to. I mean, this guy was just a monster. You're but, talking about the mountain, apparently. Yes, the mountain <laughs> is just a monster with everything that he did to uh, Oberyn's family. But you get that blind rage, that that narrow vision, and, you know, starts becoming overconfident, taunting the mountain, and, you know, takes a step too close. Well, that and, you know, in this world, and you get, you get stabbed in the stomach with a spear that we can all assume is probably poisoned with the Red Viper's history. He's red now, definitely. For for most people in this realm, that it, there's no point doing anything beyond that. You're you're just so far gone. But the mountain, who this actor is seven feet tall, uh, the actor himself has been, uh, I believe, titled as the third strongest person alive. So you just. When you're that size, I mean, it almost doesn't matter what kind of wound is inflicted. You're you're fighting on, and we know how just ferocious and voracious the mountain has been throughout the series that what you think is a sure thing is never guaranteed until you just go for the heart, cut off the head. I mean, a gut shot doesn't mean anything to the mountain for the most part. It's, and it's funny because when... You were saying, oh, down goes the mountain. And I said, you know, don't count him out just yet. And you turned to me and said, why? And I said, this is the Game of Thrones. Yep. <laughs> it's like we, something is going to happen here. And I was definitely right. Yep. And from the uh-huh. books, I mean, I totally forgot. I mean, I had an idea what the outcome was going to be because I, I know what's come next. But I, I did forget the details of the fight. And uh, it shocked me. Uh, especially that final clip. I mean, well, and the manner of his death is not the way it was in the books. It was a lot more gruesome. Yeah, but Pedro did a really good job of expressing the sheer pain that you would imagine that character being in when his eyes are being crushed into his skull, and then that just Given cracking that, sound that we get as the final. Given that contrast of the mountains hands on his head too yeah yeah she's it's like if you need it if you need a contrast of how big this guy is yeah guy's massive there's there's some fun pictures on set with pedro and the actor that plays the mountain i'm not going to try to pronounce his name i think he's some form of russian but they are just they couldn't be more different i mean pedro's considerably shorter he is I mean, anyone's scrawny by comparison, but scrawny. And this guy is just huge and muscular and massive. And I mean, there's there's also a picture of him with the actress who plays Cersei, and she, he's a good half her body length above her. I mean, I don't know how tall she is, but it's like, damn. You probably imagine she's about five five. That's an average height for a woman, give or take. He's, they say he's seven feet tall. So he's got a foot and seven inches over her. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And the actor is Icelandic. Icelandic. Okay. I remember seeing his name spelled out and it was like, nope. (laughs) Yeah, no, there's, there's letters and punctuation and characters in his name that I 
wouldn't even know how to pronounce. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you know, I think the scene of his head being crushed was pretty gruesome, pretty graphic. You know, but I guess it did really need to get a, the point across. But I, I probably really could have done without it. You know, I think <laughs> just, yeah, just the blood coming out from underneath the, his thumbs and that crack. And I like to think of myself as a strong stomach kind of person. I, doing dishes, washing dishes and all that stuff together. You think, oh yeah, you know, I can probably handle it. I'm like... Okay, I really didn't need to see that. Yeah, it, it, and like I said, the expression from Pedro is what really did it for me. He, you think he's getting his head crushed, and he was just so good expressing that. So, uh, props to him. But absolutely, I got a bit of bad news there, fellas. We are down to only two episodes for season four. Nothing. Sad face. Sad face. Sad moment of silence. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely enjoyed that. Uh, looking forward to the next one. That's all I really Absolutely. had to say about this. Alrighty. So next week will be Watchers on the Wall. And Watchers on the Wall. Double D is written and directed by Neil Marshall. Who has directed... One episode prior, and I think it may have been in either season two or season three. Uh, uh, I question. did look before. I know it's not his season Game of two, Thrones directorial Blackwater. debut. It'll be season, season two, episode nine, Blackwater. Blackwater, yep. That rings a bell. All right, guys. We'll uh, join us next week for episode nine recap, The Watchers on the Wall. 